I felt like coming to Reddit about something my friend and I experienced back in 2018. This occurred while we were driving on Lower Pine Creek Road in Chester County, Pennsylvania. I had not and have not ever had another experience like this. This winding, unlit road is surrounded by dense woods on both sides. It is a residential road, but the houses are sparse. As it was nighttime when this occurred, all we could see was what was illuminated ahead of us by the headlights of my friend's car. As we drove along, something moved across the road, emerging from the woods on our right and disappearing into the woods again on the other side of the street. It crossed just in front of the car, within range of the headlights. The reason I say moved is because the actual motion it made is difficult to describe. It was somewhere between a run and a leap, but it wasn't quite either. Bounding is the best single word I have been able to use to capture it. This all happened very quickly, as the thing moved with an alarming speed. At first I thought a deer had run across the road, but quickly ruled that out. We both sat in silence for a few seconds processing what we just witnessed. To avoid influencing my friend, I asked him what he saw, and he described it just as I recalled it. Here are the major details I remember. I knew it was not a deer because it stood on two legs, which were muscular like a human's but were hooved. The rest of its body was also lean and heavily muscled, and it had to have been between six foot five seven in height. It was bright red in color, shockingly red like a fire truck. It had a large black mane, horns, and a tail. It had mostly humanoid features and resembled a large ape. Again, it moved incredibly fast and bounded the width of the road in just a couple steps. It was probably only within range of the headlights for three or so seconds. I am not prone to believing in the supernatural, and I had never heard of anything like this, so my initial reaction was to try to figure out what we really saw. However, what really pushed me to accept what we saw as reality was an article another friend of mine sent me after recounting the incident to him. The article confirms many of the things we noticed that night. This experience was terrifying when it happened. It has completely changed my beliefs about the supernatural and has opened my mind more to other people's stories of their encounters. Over time, my fear surrounding the incident has mostly subsided, but I no longer go on night hikes in the area. Aside from the article I linked, I have not heard much about this creature, although I suspect it is related to a nearby and more famous creature, the Jersey Devil. I am interested to know if anyone has any information or similar encounters around Chester County. This happened when I was around five years old at my home. I was in the bedroom and my mom was sleeping in the bed. I was awake. Then I noticed that there was something lying on the chair by the desk that looked like a cat at first. By the way, at the moment, our family had a cat and a dog, and I remember seeing both of them in the room. It was a one-bedroom apartment, so don't be surprised that we all were in this room at once. When I approached the chair to see what kind of cat it was, I saw that it was a weird creature or an entity with the body of a cat and a head in the form of a pumpkin. As most little children, I didn't feel fear but rather interest. I decided to pet it, but when I tried to do so, the creature who had been sleeping prior to this moment suddenly hissed at me, which scared me. So after I removed my hand, it went back to sleep. The cat and the dog were minding their own boo signs, not noticing anything strange. For many years, I had been sure that it was not a dream and told this story to my friends when we had conversations about paranormal situations we encountered in our lives. But as I grew older, the feeling the, this was absolutely real faded away and I started questioning this experience, assuming that it was just a vivid dream of a child. But several years ago, I stumbled upon a post in a group of our country's local social network that described the very same creature. I was astonished. Unfortunately, I can't find this post now to reread it. Later, I came back to this memory several times and tried to Google it, but never found any other accounts. Also, this took place in Russia in the early 2000s where there was no Halloween culture with all this pumpkin stuff. But I admit that I can still see such an imagery in an American movie and just forget about it. Interestingly enough, when you Google a cat with a pumpkin head, there are plenty of images of this kind. I think the one that I saw looked more natural. I mean, the pumpkin didn't have cut out holes and the head was a part of the body, not just something worn on the head. Have anyone heard of or encountered a creature like the one I described? 
I am rather skeptical to this story, but would be interested in hearing more if anyone has something to tell. So this thing happened about four years ago, but I'm still thinking about it. I was in my parents' house, chatting with my friends online, and it was around 2 a.m. I decided to go to the bathroom, but the moment I sat down on the toilet, I heard three loud knocks on the door. I didn't say anything because I assumed if it's any of my family members, they can wait until I get out. After that, I heard some noises from the living room nearby, which sounded a lot like someone grabbing something from the table. So I was pretty sure it was my dad who knocked, and now he's waiting for me to come out in the living room. I left the bathroom to an empty living room, and then I saw that all the family members were deeply sleeping. I asked them the next day if they knocked on the door, and they said no. Any ideas about what happened? I'm not the biggest believer in the paranormal, but this experience is something unexplainable to me. I have been seeing shadowy figures that look like they are following or watching me when I walk to work sometimes. I walk to work at 5 a.m. and it's a very short three minute walk. I live in small town Iowa and there is never anyone else out when I'm walking to work. Any idea what it is? Shadow people? Dark watchers? Am I just losing it? Any help or ideas will be appreciated. I do not suffer from a lack of sleep, depression, nor any mental health issues. None have ever approached me, and I don't really feel threatened by them. Sometimes the hair on my arm will stand up though. If I stare for too long, they disappear. It doesn't always happen, and I've been seeing them for at least three years. I am part Choctaw, so I wonder if that may have something to do with it. But I have not been able to talk to any elders nor the chief about it. This took place ago in the Rockies in Colorado a few days ago. I just seek help trying to figure out if I'm crazy or bumped into something. I'd heard the stories, read plenty of them online, and seen the videos about them as well. I was never sure about them, never sure if they were real probably because I didn't want them to be because whether I'd admit it or not they were creepy, but I couldn't rule them out. I was camping half an hour outside of a small town in Colorado at about 8,500 feet, Snow covered the dirt road I took to get to the campsite. I'd only set it up earlier that day. 10-15 minutes if my drive out of town was through the park, with campsites essentially clearings with stone fire pits in them. I set up at the fourth or fifth one. I was the only camper there at the time. On one of my returns to camp, after visiting in town about 100 feet down the one one half mile into the park my trail, was I saw a herd of deer off to the left side of the trail probably seven, eight of them. They were only a few feet from the trail and all spooked, save for one deer. The deer was facing the same direction of the car before I came and was the closest to the pathway. While the other deer retreated 15, 20 feet deeper into the woods, he turned to face my car. Already only going five, 10 miles per hour and on a rough part of the trail, I wasn't passing very quickly so I slowed and stopped. He followed the whole way. For some reason I spoke to him, Unsure and slightly uneasy at this fearless deer, after all I'm treading on his land. I was protected in the car and he was an average sized deer so there was no reason to think it'd do anything to me, but somehow, someway, an animal demanded respect. I don't think I ever saw it blink, for what felt like forever, but was likely five minutes we stared at each other, the deer never moving anything about him. I thought to take a picture of him and his herd watching from behind him down the hill, but something told me not to. I talk to my dogs and I know they hear what I say, but I don't know if they listen. He listened. I told the deer I was here to visit, that I wished for a brief stay and to hopefully enjoy nature again and grow appreciation for nature once more. As if satisfied by the answer, he backed up, only a couple steps, but he backed up and I kept on. I drove and watched him in the mirror. He returned to the herd, not taking an eye off of me. I've been on plenty of camping trips, been spooked by people and critter alike wandering around camp, even having opened the flap to a deer walking through on my many trips with scouts. But this was one of my first alone. Up there, it dropped to around zero degrees, and when I was in the tent, all I wanted to do was huddle in my sleeping bag. So that's what I did, 
The sun went down quick when you're tucked between peaks, the mountains hide the sun even sooner, so it got dark and cold. If you've ever watched a four-legged animal walk, you'll know tea has a pattern. Having been around dogs all my life, it's something I've mildly found interesting. Almost always after a forefoot comes down, a rear foot follows, giving a distinct sound to their footsteps. When I was woken up at around 2-3 on the morning, my first thought was a bear late to hibernate. Knowing I had no food in the tent and only had food on the car, I stayed huddled as not to startle it or give it any reason to think I smelled like food after all. I tried to listen to it to see where it was walking. That's when I got scared. There was snow surrounding my camp. There was no mistaking every single footstep it made slow one on front of the other no matter how hard i tried to imagine there was no rear foot following just the one two one two then the pause that was the worst part i slipped my hand out of my bag that i was huddled on and grabbed the hatchet i was carrying with me trying to reassure myself i was making stuff up i pulled my hand back in and i heard it start to walk again keeping on its way the direction it had been going before stepping into my camp and eventually I couldn't hear its slow steps anymore. It was light and two-legged. That's all I could discern. The next morning I went to look. Even with the snow, it was so packed around my sight from cars and footsteps that it was either too packed or already walked over to really discern any new tracks. I stayed in a hotel the night after this happened, abandoning my gear to pack in the sunlight. Three, four inches of fresh dry snow had come down over the night, and when I walked into my camp, I noticed a trail of tracks. While the terrain was still uneven, I couldn't help but notice what looked like a set tracks tightly together, like you would see a deer's tracks, and suddenly as they left the grass and entered the dirty snow of camp, they seemed to be spaced out, almost like my own footsteps I left behind walking over to them were. If it were a skinwalker, it makes sense if JT were the deer I spoke to as they tend not to be violent in the day. But being a hunter, it saw and paid attention to where its next target would be going. But when it went on the prowl, only finding a quiet tent. Or it could have been a windigo, content with my goals of the forest, letting me leave. But coming by in the night as a warning of what was to come, seeing as what I drove into was headed for the mountains. I was driving home from work, having finished at 8 p.m. I was about halfway home, driving down a farm road in Illinois, when I started feeling really paranoid. As I drove by a large group of deer on either side of the road, I slowed to about 30 miles per hour to avoid hitting them. Their appearance wasn't unusual, but the sheer number of them and the way they made me feel struck me as odd. Around where I live, there aren't many places for deer to inhabit, just empty fields at this time of year and small privately owned woods. Additionally, there have been reports of people driving home at night disappearing, leaving only their cars parked on farm roads, with nothing missing of monetary value except personal items like phones or wallets, often found discarded nearby. I thought, I'm putting this in as it might be relevant, since in most cases, you'd only see seven or maybe eight deer, never more than that. As I continued driving, I started counting the deer, reaching 47 before I stopped. I had turned down the volume on my car's radio, my paranoia building. When I slowed to make a turn, I heard what sounded like a stampede, as far more than the 47 deer I counted ran past my car, jumping over the road and disappearing into the dark field on the other side. I drove for less than three minutes when I heard quieter hooves. Five deer approached my vehicle from the field, and as I slowed down, suppressing my fight or flight response, four of them were large bucks, almost the size of elk. The final one stood in the middle of the road in front of my car, much larger than the elk I saw in Alaska the year before, even larger than the moose near my rental cabin on the same trip. My paranoia and fear disappeared as I looked at the deer. It felt like it was trying to communicate with me, conveying its basic meaning directly to my mind. The feelings it conveyed were extreme claustrophobia, disgust at what I was in, pity for me, a desire for my escape, and finally, its love for nature and the forest that used to be there. I shut off my vehicle and began to unbuckle my seatbelt when I received an alert on my phone for daily rewards in a mobile game. This caused the deer to step back and conveyed fear to me. I lost all the peace and comfort I felt a moment before, immediately restarted my car and began to reverse. 
the deer got to the side of the road, allowing me to pass. I reversed to let the creature avoid me not out of compassion, but more out of obligation. I can't fully explain why I felt the way I did, but I sped home nonetheless. As I drove away, I got the worst headache I have ever experienced, and when I went to wipe my upper lip, I discovered blood from a nosebleed, which I hadn't realized I had. Less than an hour has passed since this happened, and I haven't had time to process it fully. I hope someone here can give me an idea. I'm part of the United States Army Special Forces, the Green Berets, have been for several years now. In my tenure, I've deployed multiple times to Afghanistan, Iraq, a few months in Syria, several African countries. I've been to all four corners of the globe, and I've seen my fair share of the good, the bad, and the ugly that comes with being part of Sakam. I've got plenty of stories, some more interesting than others, but almost all of them are heavily classified behind red tape that will never be declassified until I'm dead and gone. However, there was an incident a few nights ago that stuck out from all the others. Mostly because one, unlike all of our other operations that took us to a combat zone across the distant hemisphere, this one happened right at home in our own backyard. The enemies weren't a foreign proxy, a group of insurgents. It wasn't even human. Stuff from that night is still weird, and it's not like command is going to give us any answers. It's the reason I'm bypassing everything I've been told, disregarding and putting my ass on the line, even if I use false information and withhold names. Plenty of innocent people have died, as you'll find out, and Upper Command would sooner bury it than acknowledge their deaths and give their families closure. I don't have all the answers of what happened in that Western Tennessee National Park, but I do have enough to let people know the truth semi-truth. Anyways, for safety and privacy purposes like I stated previous, I'm withholding a lot of personal information such as names, exact locations, and unit information, referring to smaller shit that I don't think even the scary three-letter groups could really trace. Even if they cared, I hope they don't. Like I said, I'm part of a Sakam Green Berea team. You all know who the Green Berets are you should. My team is nicknamed Raider, a general theme in our company naming things after warrior culture as terms. Raider, Artemis, Barbarian, Centurion, etc. It's a 10-man element. The team lead, a way too salty Georgian captain with a warrant officer, a medic, a comm sergeant, and six weapon sergeants. Our captain decided this way was best. Considering we're all in one piece after our last mission, he was right. Our weekend was calm and boring as we got rotated on QRF Quick Reaction Force for the month. QRF means that if someone somewhere needs the green-eyed boogeyman of the Western world, we were ready to kit up and be there at a moment's notice. It just so happened, right when some of us were getting ready to head to the bar and have our two singular authorized beers of QRF month, we were called. When we raced back to our cop and got our shit ready, the captain came with some surprising information. We'd be able to probably make it back for those beers because we were heading to West Tennessee of all places. We didn't know what the status was yet. Command didn't give us any information. What the op for was, what weapons they had, what the layout of the area was. Nothing. But being QRF team, Raider still kitted up, and we were at the HLZ in less than 20. While we waited for our transport, the captain finally got some information. Apparently, a facility in the middle of uninhabited, restricted woods of a national park had activated a distress signal. The woods it was situated in was a large national park in, like I said, Western Tennessee, with a long history of disappearances on its now frequently closed and blocked off trails and campsites. This raised a few questions. What was this facility? Why was it in a national park? What happened to need to roll out the angriest Green Beret team, this side of the East Coast to act as its backup? Why were we going there when in an hour, someone in Libya or someone across Eurasia might need us to back them up? The captain acknowledged all of these questions, but assured us that's all he knew. He's been with our team for years now, several deployments to the box and back, and he's always been straight with us. It's how we knew he was lying. Our transport finally arrived, 160th SOAR, Night Stalkers, an aviation unit that's been around for nearly 40 years, having dragged every single kind of SOCOM unit to every single part of the world. We expected the Blackhawk they brought, 
but the armed escort of two birds that came with them was a surprise. We were in domestic America. We were going to Tennessee. Why were they here? Even with the Night Stalkers flying at top speeds across several states, it still took us a couple of hours to reach our landing point. The inside of that bird going full throttle was deafening. Even with the electronic headsets we were sporting, it was ear splitting. And yet, while sitting next to the captain, I could tell he was speaking to someone on a different freak. This was off because normally he'd go to the comm sergeant and have to use the radio, but he had a side channel filled in his radio, talking to someone, writing down incoming information. I was able to peek over and saw some of the things he was writing. Maskell. Close quarters offer. No blue for on X. The birds touched down in the middle of an empty parking lot outside of the local ranger station. We filed out into the open area. The birds took off. The captain chimed in on our team net. Raider Romero, this is Raider lead get on the net and have them hold orbit in case we need close air break. He then broke transmission and talked to us. All Raiders hold outside and take up security. I'm gonna get the Ragnar. Prepare for a hasty ass RAMP brief. I just got more information. We all took positions behind some of the parked vehicles the Rangers would use. Just to clear things up, our team was outfitted with GPNVG, also known as Quad Nods, four barreled night vision optics that provide an almost daytime-like view of our surroundings. Couple that with our PEQs mounted on our rifles, allowing us to see and shoot anything at night, as the military says. We own the night. The tree line in front of us was lit up like a G. Dam operator rave party as the captain walked back, nods down, as the ranger currently on shift followed him. He keyed into our net, and we could hear him through our headsets. All raiders, this is lead new information states that the facility has suffered a maskal situation break. Maskal means mass casualties. Enemy op for unidentified, however outgoing net during distress call indicates that op for is extremely dangerous and engages at close range break. There is no blue for on site. I repeat, Maine has stated there is no blue for on site, and we are to drop in any all packs we see. A few seconds passed as the captain looked back to the park ranger. Any additional comments, Ranger Clements? The man was maybe in his mid 40s, balding. He scratched the back of his neck, clearing his throat before speaking. I heard a lot of gunfire coming from down there, and don't split up. Whatever you do in these woods, don't split up. Our medic laughed. Well, that's just comforting. The captain nodded to the man as he headed back in. Everyone watch your sixes, twelves, and fives, let's go. We picked up and moved out. Everyone had their kind of final moments type of readiness drill they did before they stepped onto the path into the woods. Same shit we did before stepping off out of the fobs and compounds back east. I let out one final breath of hot air in the cold. Our medic slapped the side of his helmet, hyping himself up. The captain pulled out and kissed a small crucifix necklace from underneath his combat shirt. We headed down the pathway following the captain in a staggered column. Our IR lasers scanned the trees, rocks, and foliage around us, looking desperately for any hostiles that lurked in the darkness. Though to our paranoid readiness, nothing appeared, but something was definitely following us. When we moved through forest environments, you listened to the animals around you the crickets, the birds, the movement of animals, and what direction they're heading, how fast. Moving down that path, we couldn't hear a G. Damn thing. It's common when you're a group of heavily armed green men moving through a forest at night that some of the squirrels and birds will run the hell away, but not the crickets or the bird songs in the distance. There's a certain level of ambience that animals will maintain, even if they detect humans around. There was none of that nothing. Not a cricket, a bird, a zakata, nothing. Silent professionals. It's in our name, so when I could hear the mother F 10 meters ahead of me breathing as we moved through that dead forest, it told me that something else was here in these woods with us. A predator, and that the forest was more afraid of it than us. After a long stretch of marching down the trail, the captain held a hand up signaling a halt. As it got down to my part of the column, the middle section, he called over a radio. This is lead. On me, time now. We quickly rushed up to what we saw was a metal chain link fence. Four of our weapon sergeants and the medic took up security covering the wood line behind us as I and the other remaining one went up to the gate with the captain. 
The park's trail carried on for a few more meters before stopping dead into some trees. The dirt path broke off and formed a gravel one that led into a sectioned off area behind a chain link fence and gate. A no trespassers sign hung high, and just beyond the gate we could see a small guard shack. The captain tried to signal whoever might be in there by switching on the surefire tack light on his rifle, shining it and lasso, waving it all over the booth. However, upon stopping and centering on a doorway, we saw a large amount of blood splashed on the back wall and pooled over the floor, an arm laying halfway out the door frame. The captain looked to the other weapons sergeant with us, get your kit. He nodded, slinging his rifle as he dropped his assault pack, digging out a small pair of bolt cutters. Each of our weapons sergeants carried a different loadout depending on what we needed. One could be a gunner, another's a grenadier. Can't name him, but breach man, as I guess I'll call him always carried a breech kit, just in case. He walked over to the lock, but just as he got the blades of the cutter around the lock, we heard it. It sounded like it came from everywhere, and yet far away at the same time. Maybe it was the echo of the forest, or maybe something attributed to its abilities. It sounded like a woman yelling in pain, in agony, and yet the voice was half gargled, like it was morphed with that of a dying animal, as it had an underlying, low tone pitch beneath it. It got under the skin of everyone. Those pulling security immediately jumped their shit, scanning left, right, up and down. Hell, even the medic, big stocky dude, grew up in Brooklyn, played football before he joined meaning he is yoked as all hell when he got to our unit. The guy who once stuck his fingers into a man's neck to plug his blood, looked around nervously. The hell was that? Our weapons sergeant with the M46 shook his head as he scanned the far-off terrain, muttering in a low voice. Some horror movie bullshit right now. I remember holding my rifle's grip tight. Everyone was equally unnerved. Everyone except the captain. He just told us to press on. F sakes, tighten your jockstrap, let's go. He snapped the lock off. Immediately the captain and I moved in and cleared the small booth as two more weapon sergeants and our medic took up covering down the gravel road. It was a guard, no name tape or company logo, decked out in a black plate carrier. The plate carrier of which had been torn into as a large hole covered the entire area of his solar plexus, which was now fragmented and broken inside of his mulched upper body. No bullet entry or exit wounds. Just a large stab wound that looks like he got ran through by a lamp post. My breath still got caught in my throat as I grunted to clear it. The captain stepped out of the small booth, spitting hard into the grass, shaking his head. The medic prodded him. What was it like? He grunted walking to the front of our formation. Doesn't matter, Doc. We formed up and moved down the gravel road in a wedge column, the captain and three weapons sergeants in the front wedge, with the medic, me and the other two WS in the back one, the calm sergeant in the middle. We entered the facility lot, Immediately, the comm sergeant linked up with the captain, and I could hear him alerting Maine. This is Raider lead. We've reached the building. Though it makes me wonder if he used the comm sergeant's radio to reach our HQ. Who was he talking to on that other channel? The lot was clear, and we got a good look at the facility. It was a gray concrete rectangle, maybe the size of a small gas station. Floodlights mounted on the bottom illuminated the gravel lot up to the dense, shadowy wood line that lay just beyond the chain link fence, the wood line that was still quiet. The mascal carnage we were told about was present outside of the building. Several guards, all in various states of mutilation, similar to the gate guard, were strewn about the gravel lot. However, unlike the gate guard, strangely, they were in heavier body armor, with rifles capable of going automatic and spent brass everywhere. Me and some of the other guys got online and cleared out the back. Exasperated breaths and muttering came from all of us. The captain chimed in. Raiders on me, time now. We hauled ass back to him as we stacked up at the door. Flowing in, we were greeted to a lobby, torn up, furniture thrown everywhere. Impact marks from rounds hitting the concrete lined the walls and ceiling. One dead guard slumped against a red stained part of the wall, the other in a crumpled heap. A woman at the desk, not a guard, just a staff member, sat back in her chair her entire torso area torn apart. As we passed by her and headed through the double doors behind her, her empty dead eyes met mine. The comm sergeant eyed her as we all moved for the door. Sir, she was unarmed, 
I can see that. Keep chatter to a minimum. We cleared through the double doors to be greeted by a porcelain hallway leading into a set of stairs heading to a sublevel. The entire surface, ceiling, walls, floor was lined with ceramic white tiles. Ceramic white tiles that were like the rest of the scene so far. Stained with the blood, guts, and even brain matter of the unlucky guards laid out all the way down the stairs. I counted eight. Seventeen so far. A flickering light could be seen through the wire glass windows of the double doors at the bottom. The captain ordered us to flow in through both sides, we did. Pushing in we could see we entered into a T-style hallway. It gets a bit complicated here. Either end of the T ended while the middle one shot forward far down into a hall leading to two reinforced blast doors at the very end. Two immediate labs on either side were reinforced with more wire glass, and despite several cracks, impact marks, bullet holes, and even holes made in the glass, they held. This shit can't be ballistic glass. Our comms sergeant muttered. Why didn't they just take cover in here? The medic said. The captain sighed. Seems to be pointing to a surprise attack from the inside. Emphasis on surprise, jackass. The medic fired back. Well, sure, but it's just a door. While the hallways outside were a mess of blood, gore, guards thrown around as they were ripped apart, creating a mess of bodies, weapons, and more spent brass, the lab techs had their white coats stained with their own blood. My blood, and I think everyone else's started to run cold as the pieces came together. Whatever killed them, did so indiscriminately. We formed a rolling T heading into down the hall. I was on the right, with the gunner taking center, and another guy on let. The captain pushed forward leading us from behind. The windowed labs ended halfway, with two solid white doors near the double doors at the end on either side leading to closed off labs. The captain had us pull guard on both of the side doors as the gunner aimed back down the hallway. Everyone else took up security wherever it was needed. The captain eyed the door, feeling the cracks and lines of the blast doors, looking for gaps that didn't exist. Blood had slowly leaked out of the bottom, causing him to pick up his boot and eye it, and yet no openings existed. An electronic pad was positioned on the right side of the doors, the captain eyed it. It was a hand scanner, I didn't even think those actually existed. He jumped on that private freak, I keep mentioning. I'm at the doors. Yeah, at the far end, there's a hand scanner. He waited a few seconds of deafening silence. He made an internal chuckle as he walked over to the dead body of a guard, kicking its arm. Got one right here. I'm sorry, repeat last. Alive? He rubbed his face, cursing under his breath. F. He shook his head, turning on the white light on his rifle and scanning the corpses. This place is a G. Damn slaughterhouse. How am I gone? A crash emanated from the white lab door to the right of the blast doors, the one I was covering. Everyone paused for a second as a second weapon sergeant aimed his laser at it. The captain turned, aiming his laser at the door as he approached. Might have one, or might have op for actual. Wait one over. The captain formed up as first man in the stack, an unusual practice, but everyone else fell behind. I was the second man, two more made third and fourth. A weapon sergeant felt the edges of the door, then tried the handle. Locked. Him trying the handle must have alerted whatever was inside, because a voice bellowed out. I, I'm in here, please, I'll let you in, just don't shoot. The doorman looked to the captain, who nodded, might have blew for inside, stay sharp, wait on me to fire. There wasn't supposed to be any blue for on sight. The door's electronic lock opened. The doorman grabbed the handle and pulled it open as the four of us entered the room. We pushed through, the captain hooked left, I pushed forward. The other two followed one of us respectively, our lasers centered on the room and a pair of hands emerging from behind a lab table. P please, the voice weakly shouted, the captain stormed over. Hands, now, I'll shoot you I swear to God if you don't put your G damn hands up. As the person stood up, we saw the hands were connected to a scientist, possibly late thirties, stringy hair with circular glasses. Glasses that flew off when the captain closed the distance, shoving him against a metal cabinet, spittle flying from the bearded mouth beneath the NVGS as he barked at him. ID, where is it? Show it. The captain began roughly searching the lab tech as he pulled out his ID. He grabbed it, shoving him to the weapons sergeant on his side of the room. The lab tech was kicked down to his knee. The captain jumped back on that freak. 
I'm back, possible bluefer, prepare for ID code. He read it off in phonetics before he got the response. He looked to the weapon sergeant guarding the lab tech. Get his ass up. P please, I don't know what's going on. I was just running some chemical tests. We've got to get out of here before. The captain got in the man's face. Shut up. He did. You know what you've been doing? I know what you Sansa bitches been doing out here. Open them doors right now. The man was shocked as the captain continued. Open the G-damn doors. With a point from the captain, the weapons sergeant shoved the man forward into the doorframe. The man crumbled a little bit as the captain laughed. Take your sweet time, doctor. Let's go. I picked him up by his shirt collar and dragged him over to the blast doors. The captain pushed him out of my grip, shoving him face first into the doors. Hand on the scanner now. As the captain grabbed the man by his wrist, the lab tech struggled to get free. Please, I don't have that access. I hurt my hand trying to hide, let me go. The medic winced at the sight a bit uncharacteristically of a green beret, especially for a jaded as all hell medic, he spoke up. Cap, come on. The captain just turned, staring daggers into the man as he wrestled for the man's wrist. Just wait till y'all see, I'm telling ya. As the man struggled against the captain, the weapon sergeant came up from behind, shoving the man into the blast door, allowing the captain to easily place it on the scanner. The scanner lit up in a bright blue as several lines traced and looked over his handprint. It then flashes green as the electronic locks of the blast doors begin to open up. The captain dropped the man. Well, goodness gracious, what do ya know? The doors slowly pulled open. The room was dark, red flashing emergency lights flashed all around as the sound of broken glass scrapped against the door. A stream of murky blue liquid, mixed in with the blood of several guards' bodies that were revealed at the doorway, leaked out into the hall. The captain grabbed the lab tech by the collar, dragging him to his feet. Y'all know these men, doctor? Friends? The captain shoved him through the doorway, the lab tech slipping on the fluids and glass, cutting his right hand with a wince. We flowed in and... Jesus. I said this at the start. I've been all over. I've seen mass graves that terrorist cells have used in far-off countries filled with entire villages worth of people. I've seen kill dens inside tunnel systems. This surpassed all of that. Every horror. Every war crime. Multiple times over. A series of gigantic glass tubes line the walls, walls made out of monitors, hard drives, and computer systems. The path of carnage led through the pile of guards at the doorway. That makes 24 armed personnel that were taken out by something. What really bothered me was what was in those murky, blue and green glass tubes. As big as a refrigerator, connected to a port on the bottom and top. Tubes and wires inside connecting to. The captain shoved the lab tech into a glass tube. The pop of the man's nose echoed off the empty area as he grabbed his nose. Well, Doc, which one was it? Which goddamn tube? Tube. What was he talking about? How did he know? Who was on the freak? The lab tech spit out blood leaking into his mouth as the captain, standing at six foot five, a giant even among his team full of brawny soft operators, picked him up by the collar of his blue undershirt. I don't. Two weapon sergeants ducked out of the way as the captain got in his face, shoving him against the left side wall, causing the monitors and computer systems to beep and light up. Oh, you don't know. And yet your little hand opens the room you didn't have access to? He roared, abandoning all silence and discretion now as the man began to sputter and sob. P please. Please I. The captain gritted his teeth. He quickly flipped up his nods and stared daggers into the man's soul. How many people you snatched off that trail? How many? What kinds of butchering you do to those kids before you stuck them in there? Which one escaped? Kids. Butchering. Something in my mind stopped, and I switched on my rifle's tack light. A heavy pit in my stomach formed as I flashed it on the tubes. There were people in those tubes. There were people. Wire and tubes now poked into see-through and murky flesh as the bodies of the kidnapped floated, mutated, dissected, and changed. One person's skin ran reptilian-like up their left arm before merging with a strange gaping hole in their chest, their skull protruding out of the skin in their head. My breathing stuttered a bit as I backed up a few steps, glass crunching under my boots. 
curses muttered by the others in the room as we all began to look. Another one's mouth was sealed at the front, two more jagged, messed up sets of teeth poked out either side. Their eyes were sealed, skin covering defined sockets on their head. The medic flashed his on one where their spin stuck out through their back. The vertebrae was larger than a normal person's, the bones sticking out inches longer in some areas. Jesus man, this shits. He gagged a bit, coughing as he looked away. I had to pry my eyes, my mind was frying just looking at. They better be dead. Oh, I swear to the Lord himself if they ain't, the captain said sternly as the man sobbed and nodded. Yes, the captain raised an eyebrow. You sure? Yes, they died during surgery. If you're lying to me, I swear to Christ, I will make you euthanize every single one. The captain shoved the lab tech forward into the center of the aisle. I looked down, shaking my head as the images of those things burned into the film of my brain. Where's she gone, doctor? The captain said sternly, squaring up to the man who sobbed as he shrugged. Aye, aye. Where is it? The man continued to cry. It escaped. It killed everyone. It cut through the guards. It cut through everyone. All of my friends. This caused the captain to nearly bust a blood vessel from the look he gave him, balling up his fist and driving the armored knuckle of his Oakley glove into the gut of the lab tech. This caused the smaller, weaker lab tech to buckle over, dropping to his hand and knees, now favoring an injured hand and a probably burst spleen. Your friends? Your friends? You mean the friends that kidnapped a 22-year-old girl and a 14-year-old son and turned them into monsters? What about them? This earned only more sobs from the lab tech as the captain turned, hands on his hips as scoffed. He looked at the medic, who only stared back through his nods. The captain turned to look at him. You got to the count of ten, and if you don't give me a single whereabouts of this thing, I will start grabbing tools and cutting your little weasel ass up like you'll did to these kids. The captain loomed over the man, grabbing him by his hair. Sir, please, the lab tech pleaded. One, two, three, the captain counted. Some looked away, others shook their heads. Not out of shame of our leader. There wasn't a man in the room who wouldn't do what he did right now after seeing them. It's it's in the woods. You heard it. It did it. Freaky yell just like 10 minutes ago. The captain laughed, letting go of the man's hair as he whipped his head forward. Y'all hear that? It's in the woods. He pulled out his M17, his 9M sidearm, pulling the slide back a bit to make sure it was chambered. Four, five, six. The man stood up, and at this point, I kicked out his extended leg, dropping him back to his knees. The man looked at me, then at the captain. You can't do this. This is illegal. Before the captain could finish his could, we heard it. It echoed all the way down the facility halls, reverberating off the glass tubes in the room. That half-feminine, half-monstrous cry. Except this time, it didn't come from the far-off mountains or trees. It came from up the stairs. Then the lights went out. I don't know if it was prior damage to the facility, the electric works, or something else, but they zapped out. The lights in the halls, the lights on the stairs, the lights in the room, the electronics, the lights in the tanks, all of it. It cried out again, and this time, I think I heard it say, help me. Anyone who had their nods up, flicked them down as all of us trained our lasers down the dark hall beyond the doors. The slight shakiness of all the green lasers told the same stories, all of the death, all of the shit in the tanks that had everyone spooked. The captain came up alongside me and the medic. He looked back to the lab tech. You run, you die. The man swallowed and smothered his misery. I, I know, the captain corrected him in a low tone. No, you really don't. The creature cried out again. Help me. The sounds of something hard impacting the tile floors sounded out as it approached us through the dark abyss. More footsteps, then another cry. Help me. The gunner lets out a shaky breath as he cracks his neck. More footsteps, then another cry. Help me. It's maybe five meters from the door now. Lord Almighty, the captain muttered. I couldn't see much in that darkness then, but I saw what everyone else saw. I saw enough. Its body was easily six feet tall. Two gigantic, bony, mantis-like legs that were dark from blood stepped into the doorway. Its head was smooth, 
its large teeth shining in the darkness, and its eyes glowed like an animal. Its eyes glowed. It could see us. We all froze. We had rifles trained on it, a machine gun trained on it, a room full of green berets, the best of the best, and everyone froze. The captain was the first to fire, slamming his trigger as he shot point two two three death into that crime against existence. The gunner opened up as well, and then the medic, two more weapon sergeants also shot it. It yelled at us, cried out, like an agonized woman pleading for help. Then it lunged. Running and slamming through a test tube, glass flew everywhere causing several of us to shield our faces as the water flooded the floor and the deformed body that was inside flopped down near our feet. A horrendous, rotted smell filled the air. Jesus, the medic sputtered out, gagging a bit as he kicked it away. The creature now screamed as a rifleman that had jumped near backed up. It leaped on top of him, shoving that bony mandible into his left shoulder, pinning him to the ground as he screamed, thrashing his elbow into the thing as he kicked its stomach. But it didn't attack him, it just eyed the scientist. He attempted to run for his life, but the thing jumped on top of him, pinning him face first into the murky wet floor. That's when I noticed the six smaller human-like arms on its torso. Its main mandible pinned him to the ground, the arms, some normal, some with bony spikes for fingers, others just lined with sharp teeth began to rip into the man's back. The lab tech screamed, his lab coat was torn open as it began to dig down into his back. Some still fired shots, but it didn't, didn't even react, it didn't even move. Just continued to tear into that vial, but poor son of a bitch. The captain's voice lit up the comms as he and the medic rushed to pick the man up and heave him on the captain's shoulders. We can't engage him here outside now. He was right, it thrived on close quarters, it ran guys through before they could pick it apart. We all ran, nerves shot, weapons hot from firing into a thing that didn't react. The power off so we couldn't close those blast doors, all we could do was run. I nearly slipped on the glass as we booked it out of there, firing some desperate pot shots into the lab with the gunner. The lab tech screams echoed throughout the hallway as we booked it up the stairs. It was going to be done with him soon. The gunner and I covered the captain as we broke out into the open air, the smell of rot and death replaced by the open piney air of the forest. Several men broke out road flares, tossing them everywhere giving us much needed light in the form of greens, blues, reds and purples. The captain dropped the man behind a beaten up and wrecked sedan as the medic began to patch him up. The gunner deployed his bipod and aimed at the doors of the facility from the car's hood. The captain positioned different men to where they all could fire on the door, far enough away from the thing's grasp. Romero, get on that net and call in that air. The calm sergeant began to go to work behind the sedan. I took aim behind a large SUV with several others. We all aimed at the door. The screaming had stopped. The silence was broken by its bony mandibles as it rushed out into the open air, and with all the flares and chem lights and even the captain's tack light, we finally got a good look. Its skin was a mix between pink from its exposed muscles to a see-through clear layer covering other parts. Bony calcium-like armor had formed over a lot of its body, and its back to legs formed smaller mandible-like features at the back, and its head. An exposed skull all to human eyes peering out at is in rage as its larger, unhinged jaw opened and it roared out its deafening cry at us. The gunner was the first to open up. The blast of 5.56 tore through the armor on its mandible legs and torso. The thing recoiled at first and then hissed as it charged forward. The captain ran from his place in front of the sedan's side. The thing stuck its two large mandibles into the roof, badly denting it. The medic quickly covered the wounded weapon sergeant, shielding him as the thing peered down at the two. The captain quickly got its attention, aiming fire at the back of its head. It roared with a vengeance as it charged at the captain. He fell back to the sedan running out of our line of fire as the thing barreled towards us. The thing stuck a mandible inside the hood, impaling it, and then another just to my left. I circled around and behind it as I fired. It cried out blood now pouring from its wounds as its calcium plating was cracking and falling off en masse. The thing turned to me, and as I flicked my M4 to auto and laid into it, it just barreled at me, shoving me to the ground. Its smaller, demonic hands reached for me as I kicked them away. Its jaws snapped as I held my rifle in the way, shielding my face as it gnawed on the metal. The gunner then blasted a chunk of its exposed skull away, 
Staggering it as it turned, the captain whipped his stock into the thing's head, then backpedaled as he fired off another burst of rounds. The thing turned at him, roaring viciously as the captain dropped his empty mag. He slapped in a fresh one as the thing lunged at him, both mandibles raised. The glass exploded out of the sub's windows as the captain dropped levels, firing into its stomach as he circled out back into the open. The creature roared as it went to move for him again, but it couldn't. Its large mandibles were stuck all the way inside of the vehicle. The captain let his rifle hang slung on his front as he reached for something on his kit, an M67 fragmentation grenade. Get back. Everyone who was in the open ducked for cover. The gunner and several weapons sergeants retreated behind a series of concrete jersey barriers. I ran and slid behind the sedan, helping the medic to shield our wounded battle buddy. I heard the distinct sound of the spoon flying and the whistling of the grenade. The captain vaulted himself over the car hood with the comm sergeant, covering his radio operator's head as they both went prone. The explosion was thunderous. The shock wave of the grenade shook everyone and even rattled me a bit from being so close. Shrapnel and fragments flew everywhere, impacting the concrete barriers. The building, any windows on the sedan that already weren't broken, were shattered. A few seconds passed as we all hesitantly started to life our heads, then dropped them as the sub's gas tank seemingly erupted and detonated. Engulfing the wreck in a fireball to large, I felt like the flames were touching my face. The captain popped up, aiming on top of the hood of the car. Then I and several others joined him, peeking from behind our points of cover as we looked to see if that had done it. The SUV was a burning skeleton, an inferno from all of the ignited gasoline covered the frame, the ground around it and the beast, as it definitely pulled its last remaining mandible, its front left one. The only appendage it had left and stumbled out from the flames. Its skin popped, its muscles boiled, and with all of the sea through skin and bone plating torn and burnt off, it gazed around, its eyes ruptured and melted. Help me. The gravel crunched as its charred and still burning body slumped forward. The captain emerged from behind the Vic as only a few of us dared to approach the thing. He lifted his nods, this time pulling his M17 back up and aiming it at the thing's head. Three shots into the thing's head, the damaged and charred skull caving in. A circle of light illuminated us as the rotary blades of the Black Hawk sounded out overhead. I shielded my face and lifted my nods to avoid the spotlight blinding me. Up for actual down, building secure. The ensuing hour was one that was just shrouded in. I don't know, mystery, I guess. The captain went against prior missions of telling us to go prone and pull security, putting the gunner at the sedan by the gate and telling the rest of us to watch the wood line. When the vans showed up, that's when he told us to chill out. They weren't really vans, they were more like armored trucks. Now, for the sake of being classified and remaining anonymous, I can't divulge a lot about them. I'm definitely not saying the black shirts were wearing black multicam combat uniforms with kits, weapons, and gear available that would definitely make them a private sector group. I'm not saying their uniforms were sterilized with all patches, logos, and markers stripped. I'm also not saying that the hazmat suits looked way beyond anything our MOP system has. I'm not saying they brought several metal case in from their armored VIX, and I'm not saying they brought an advanced surveillance drone with them. I will say they weren't really hostile F. One even offered us a cigarette. The bird landed at the opposite side of the building, the open lot where they eventually told us to head. We prepared our guy for case vac on a litter with the Black Hawk and loaded up as the captain finished talking to some guy in a suit. He was much shorter, maybe five foot eight. He bore the look of a younger, but still weathered man. His hair was slicked back and had a hard part. A slight bump underneath his sports coat told me he was armed. The captain eventually joined us as soon as the aviation crew shut the door, he popped his helmet off much to their anger and slumped back in his seat. When we touched base and got back to the cop, our sister team, Artemis replaced us on QRF. I've been thinking about that shit for days now, about what those people did to them in that lab, what the captain said. They kidnapped them, cut them up, changed them. All for what? Some sick fantasy? Who the F even owned that lab? There were no U.S. markings, no logos, zip. Like I said before, there's still a lot I don't know, but what I do know is that those men got exactly what they deserved. That thing crying out for help, pleading for us to make its suffering end. 
The more I think about it, the more it makes me sick. I don't know who the F those guys were that relieved us. They didn't have any markings. Some of them were speaking German if my memory serves. But whoever they are, I hope they learn from their mistakes. And never tamper with that evil shit again. I've been hunting once and had a lot of fun, but near the end of it, we saw a little path and decided to follow it. It brought us to a small little clearing where we saw five dolls. They were the type you saw in horror movies, and they were all beaten up and one of them had no head, and there was blood on the trees near them. Let's just say we all looked at each other and ran for our lives. In the middle of the hills, Riding my horse through the hills, my horse started snorting. I smelled a back smell, but my nose was running anyways from allergies. My horse kept stopping and wanting to turn back. I had to go forward or I could not get to where I was going. We got to a big rut like where a stream once was, and there was a big tarp with cinder blocks on top of it. My horse was so nervous, he rushed past it real quick, jumping over it. I turned around to look and saw an arm. This was before cell phones rode home fast as I could and told my mom. The cops came and I had to show them where it was. Long story short, turned out to be a hooker. They figured she had only been there a day or two. My friend and I trespassed into the old and abandoned train station in our town. It was a huge abandoned complex with a three-story office building on one side and the giant wooden and concrete station on the other side with three four stories. This place had been abandoned for 20 plus years at least. We already knew that within the last five, 10 years, someone had been cooking meth in part of the building and a fire broke out. So one end was pretty burned down. We came in at the second story of the station to see the roof and floor caving into the first level from the fire. As we continued on the daylight was no longer reaching the interior of the building, so we turned our torches on. We saw proof of a homeless population living there, but no one was around. We kept on through the building trying to get to the other side where there was more natural light that would lead out toward the office building. Okay, so the creepiest thing I remember seeing in this very old, very abandoned and filthy place was all in one room in the middle of the station. The ceilings had to be 15 feet high or more, and on one end of the wall in one cavernous room were cages. These cages or cells were as tall as the ceiling. One cell could easily fit an elephant, I swear. But these cells were immaculately clean. The metal wasn't tarnished or rusting, and there was even brand new wooden boards along the top and bottom of these cells that looked like they had just been installed. There was nothing in any of the cages. We left the station and went to the office building where we found two dudes stripping copper from the walls. It was unnerving because we were two girls in our early 20s, but neither party said a word, and that's when we left. This is pretty mild, but it gave me chills when it happened. So I like to explore and fish a lot. They coincide a lot anyway, so it's a pretty big passion of mine. I was hiking along a creek in a rural county near my home, and some dense game lands about eight or so miles from any house, probably at least double that from a major road or settlement. I had hiked for a while and was seeing hardly any sign of human presence. Nearly every place I go in my state I can find garbage, hunting trash, or any other sign that people have been there. If I see nothing, it is sort of a good sign that the area is undisturbed. As I was hiking I heard gunshots far away. Not uncommon either, but the forest was weirdly quiet. And yes, cliche incoming, I felt super uneasy, as if there was another someone there. Eventually I found something really strange, and I've looked for the picture forever but can't find it. It was a small metal box, and I was well versed enough to know it was a geocache, out in the open at the base of a tree. Let me remind you, this is several miles through thick woods and no sign of human habitation or influence. The box was rusty and looked to have been through a lot. I tried opening it, but a lot of sediment and rust had accumulated, and I got a little give, but nothing significant. There was definitely stuff rattling around, so I tried a ton, but nothing would work. I realized that this story is probably boring, and there was probably nothing even in it. 
but it seemed very strange to find this so far out I knew I had to get it open somehow. I left it as I found it and put a piece of duct tape on the tree next to it to find it again. I left and went home. I downloaded the geocaching app, but the box wasn't registered anywhere, nor were there really any geocaches along that creek at all, none registered for miles. So either it wasn't a geocache, or maybe just really old. Anyways, the very next day I went back, armed with a crowbar, hammer and pliers. I went back to the exact spot it was, and I knew it was the right spot. The duct tape was balled up on the ground beside the tree, and the box was nowhere to be found. I looked all around and couldn't find it, at which point, several miles from civilization and several more from cell service, I booked it out of there. I realize this isn't that creepy, spooky, supernatural, etc. But this put me on the edge more than anything else I've ever been through. This incident occurred in Texas in the early 2000s. I'm not saying I saw the Tooth Fairy, but it was the night that I lost my first tooth. I wrote a letter to the Tooth Fairy and left it on my nightstand and had a glass of water by my bed. I was five years old at the time. I woke up in the middle of the night because I heard the glass of water hit the floor. I opened my eyes and I saw a very small light moving slowly across the room, probably five feet up in the air. It was golden in color and small. It just looked like a dot of light to me, but I also had terrible vision and didn't have my glasses on. As it neared the doorway to my room, a new doorway opened on the wall to the side of the door, right over the place where a picture of my great-grandmother's embroidery hung. It was like a black rectangle void, but it had red velvet curtains. The light moved slowly toward it, and that's when I noticed the shadows. Silhouettes of animals danced all over my room. Following the light in a line, there was a bear, a big cat of some kind. I know there were other shadows, but I can't remember which animals. I looked and my tooth was still on my nightstand, but when I turned my head again, there was a shadow creeping at the end of my bed. It had fins like a shark or a dolphin, but it had two of them. At this point, the light was almost through the doorway, and it seemed like the portal door was closing, but the thing at the end of my bed was getting bigger in size. Being five years old, I did the reasonable thing and hid under the covers, where I fell asleep. The next morning, there was money on the nightstand and a note from the Tooth Fairy, obviously in my mother's handwriting. But the water glass that had woken me had rolled under my nightstand, still on the floor. If it wasn't for the water glass on the floor, I would have thought the whole thing was a dream. The fairy didn't seem interested in me at all, only the shadow at the end of my bed. A small speck of golden light. Why a fairy? Mainly because it happened on the night I lost my first tooth, but the fairy didn't take the tooth. I always thought it was just paying me a visit. I felt calm when I looked at the light, but the shadows scared me. This experience left me obsessed with fairies through the rest of my childhood, but I never had an experience like that afterward. I've read a lot of lore and mythology about fairies. In my opinion, they are magical beings that can't be seen unless they want to. The animal shadows I saw that night haunt my dreams to this day. I don't know if the shadows were fairies, or just hanging with a little gold fairy, but I only got the sense that the one at the end of my bed was evil, not the bear or the big cat. I thought the bear was funny. He was walking on his hind legs and waving his arms like he was dancing. The one at the end of my bed seemed cold and dark. I've told this story before, but didn't really get an explanation. My husband and I were hiking in Jasper Park, Canada. We were talking and passing other hikers every 15-20 minutes or so. We got to a part of the trail that reaches the peak, and then slowly starts to move down the side of a foothill, and the trail is on the side of a slope. We hadn't seen anyone in maybe 30 minutes. All of a sudden, the entire earth started to shake, and there was a thunderous noise. We both squat down together and looked frantically around, trying to find the source of the noise, but we saw nothing and heard nothing like branches breaking. I thought for sure it was an elk or something, but if there was an animal, it would have been on the trail either ahead of us or behind us. We started to make loud noises and I started cracking two rocks together. We kept doing this until we saw another couple hikers about 15 minutes later. We asked if they heard or felt anything and they said no so we warned them that there may be an animal on the trail ahead. 
it would be nice to know what it was. When I was younger, probably in the sixth grade, I was at one of my dad's fishing camps. This one happened to be a 1987 Dodge Sportsman rotting in some old logging camp about two hours north of where I live. I always hated going because my dad always day drank there and had a general lack of regard for safety departing in a 14-foot aluminum fishing boat with a 20-year-old 8-horsepower motor while you're hammered with your kid and his friend, for example. One time when we were there, I can distinctly remember bright, consistent flashes about every three seconds that lit up half the sky on the horizon. I still don't know what it is. I've seen something similar whilst tenting at a local campground. It was so dim that it was hardly noticeable. When I saw it up at the fishing camp, it was almost as bright as lightning. At the local campground, I assumed it was maybe a lighthouse or something, because the campground wasn't too far inland from Lake Superior. However, the fishing camp is nearly a two-hour drive north. I'm going to guess that it had something to do with the nearby Lac des Illes mine. However, now that I'm thinking about it, I think I remember the flashes coming from the east. The mine is to the south. I haven't been there in probably three years, and it's been half a dozen since that took place. So that's about all I can remember. I'm going to go look on Google Earth later to see if there's anything east of the camp, or just look for a plausible source of the illumination. This story happened to one of my dad's friends, Everett, so here it goes. When most people think of Bigfoot, they think of some nice hairy creature that walks around the woods, has big feet, and doesn't like getting his picture taken. These people are dead wrong. Everett and his friend Milo were hunters. Ever since they were 16, they would go on hunting trips together. However, now being experienced adults, they were no longer hunting deer. This weekend, like most, they were going bear hunting in the mountains of Montana. Now, if you don't know how bear hunting works, what you do is, you go to a butcher shop. Here they will have plenty of scraps from the meat that day. Pig guts, cow skin, chicken blood act. They would take these scraps from the butchers, put them in big, five-gallon buckets, and strategically space them out in the forest about a mile away from each other. Then, they would hike between each bucket, hoping to see a bear with his head in the bucket, waiting to get shot. So, Saturday evening around noon, they get the buckets, get their guns, put them in their truck, and drive to their hunting spot. Everett and Milo each grab two buckets and their guns and walk into the forest. About two miles north from the car, Milo placed his first bucket in a little clearing, surrounded by forest. They then walked straight east about a mile and Everett placed down the second bucket, then a mile north placed the third bucket, and finally a mile west, and they placed the last bucket. Now they had a big square of buckets filled with guts that they could walk around to. The day passes without incident. They spend almost the entire day walking between the buckets, and they don't see a single trace of a bear. So around seven o'clock, it starts to get dark, so they decide they will do one more loop between the buckets and then head home. They walk to the second bucket. No bear. They dump out the guts and bring the empty bucket with them. The same thing for the third bucket and the fourth. They are very discouraged and think that they'll go home empty-handed as they walk to the last bucket. But as they approached around 9 p.m., the birds fell silent. This was a very good sign and usually meant that there was a bear nearby. As they got closer, Everett smelled something horrendous. It smelled like rotting meat, and it definitely wasn't their buckets. With their hopes high and their noses covered, they carefully and quietly approached the edge of the clearing. In the middle, surrounded by trees, eating out of the bucket, was the biggest bear they had ever seen, with its back to them. It must have been ten feet if it was on its hind legs. With Milo holding the buckets at the time, Everett grabbed his rifle and scoped in on the bear. Getting a closer look in this thing, he realized something. It wasn't eating with its head in the bucket like most bears do. It was scooping handfuls of guts into its mouth, using its hands. The fur of it also looked like nothing he had ever seen before. It was matted all over and looked like it had things stuck in it. 
Everett turned towards Milo and pointed at the bear. Milo shrugged and tried to make a shooting motion. Everett aimed his gun back at the thing and got ready to shoot. Then Everett heard something behind him. The thunk of a bucket hitting the ground. Through the scope, Everett saw the bear immediately stop eating and turn its head and look straight into Everett's eyes. This was no bear. The creature's face, dripping with blood, was almost human-like. Flaring nostrils, mouth open with guts falling out. They were petrified with fear. The thing charged and human instinct kicked in. Milo dropped the buckets and they ran. They ran as fast as they could towards the car. But close behind them, they could hear the thing running after them. But it didn't sound like a bear crashing through the brush. It sounded like a human running on two legs. This just encouraged them to run faster. After sprinting in pure fear through the pitch black forest for 15 minutes, the only thing keeping them running from the creature was the adrenaline pumping through their veins. They were close. They must have been five minutes from the car when from behind Everett, he heard Milo trip on a log. Everett kept running. He heard the steps of the creature stop, but he kept running, and then through his crashing footsteps, he heard Milo's blood-curdling, heart-wrenching scream. It took all his willpower to not turn around for his friend. Finally, he reached the edge of the forest and saw his truck. He ran to the driver's side, got in and locked the doors. He waited in complete silence and fear for Milo. He waited for five minutes, for ten minutes, for fifteen minutes, hoping to see his friend burst through the trees. But he never came. After twenty minutes of waiting in terror, he drove off, trying not to think of what had just happened to his friend. Once he got home, he immediately called the cops and searches began. However, Milo didn't have many family or friends besides Everett, so the searches didn't last too long. After only a week, they gave up and Milo's body was never found. It was a hot and humid day in Texas as our Navy SEAL team set out on what was supposed to be a routine training exercise. We were deep in the heart of the wilderness, far from civilization, conducting drills near a mysterious black lagoon that had an eerie aura about it. Little did we know that this day would turn out to be anything but routine. As we approached the lagoon, we noticed an unsettling stillness in the air. The water looked murky and dark, giving off an eerie vibe that sent a shiver down my spine. We exchanged glances, a silent acknowledgement that something was not right. As we cautiously stepped closer to the lagoon, the hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. That's when we saw a pale, human-like hand emerging from the water. It had large claws and shiny, glass-like skin, covered in a clear liquid that seemed to glisten in the sunlight. We knew we were dealing with an unknown creature, and the tension in the air thickened. My heart pounded in my chest as the creature slowly revealed itself. It had a large, terrifying face with milky white skin and eyes that seemed to pierce through our souls. Its bluest veins under the eyes were like intricate patterns of power and dread. I couldn't tear my gaze away, even as my mind screamed at me to flee. The creature's tongue, long and serpentine, was the only thing moving other than the trees swaying in the wind. Its antlers, black like mold, sprouted from its head, adding an alien aspect to its appearance. This massive, deer-like humanoid stood before us, towering at a height of seven to eight feet. It exuded an aura of primal power and ancient malevolence. Fear gripped us all, but we were Navy SEALs trained to face the most formidable adversaries. With adrenaline coursing through our veins, we readied our weapons, knowing that our survival depended on it. The creature roared, a bone-chilling sound that reverberated through the air, and charged towards us. The battle was fierce, and we fought with all our strength, each move precise and calculated. The creature's agility surprised us, and its claws were capable of tearing through our gear effortlessly. We could sense that it was not just a mindless beast. It was intelligent, cunning and intent on surviving. Through sheer determination and teamwork, we managed to land a critical blow, and the creature collapsed to the ground. Its deathly cry echoed in the wilderness, making the very earth tremble. We had won, but the price had been high some of our team members were injured, 
and the lagoon had turned into a pool of blood and turmoil. As we regrouped to analyze the creature and understand what we had faced, our commanding officer arrived at the scene. His stern face showed a mix of curiosity and concern as he demanded an explanation for the chaotic situation. Hesitant but honest, we recounted the events that had unfolded. To our surprise, the commander laughed, dismissing our story as an elaborate prank or a result of heat-induced hallucinations. Anger and frustration welled up within us as he accused us of lying, questioning our integrity. Determined to prove the truth, we led our commander to the corpse of the creature. However, as we arrived at the lagoon, our hearts sank the creature's lifeless body was nowhere to be found. It had vanished without a trace, leaving only the eerie stillness of the black waters. The commander's expression turned grim, and he ordered us to conduct a thorough investigation. What was initially treated as a mere training exercise had now become an enigma, a mystery we couldn't ignore. We combed the area, analyzing every piece of evidence, but the creature had left no physical trace of its existence. As the sun set, we stood at the edge of the Black Lagoon, the unsettling silence engulfing us. We knew the truth of what we had encountered, but without evidence, our tale would remain just that a story. I used to live deep in the Santa Cruz Mountains and often hiked and camped there growing up. As a teenager, I went hiking on a secluded trail, and as I often would, I'd take a nap on a sleeping bag I'd bring and take off my shoes and dip my feet in the creek. One day, I woke up and my shoes were gone, and in their place was a pile of rocks. I still cannot explain that one, and it still freaks me out. I moved back when I was 25 and rented a small cottage on a very large property far up in the mountains of Bonnie Dune. It was really rural and secluded and pitch black at night. I'd often hear screams of coyotes in the distance. We had some cats on the property that were friendly and one had a litter of kittens. They were really cute and I would take them in and feed them. There was a point where I was all alone on the property and one morning I came out and one of the kittens was laid across my doorstep dead. No trauma, no sign of anything wrong with it. It wasn't even cold enough for them to freeze. The little kitten I had played with the day before was dead. This happened for a week until all the kittens were dead and laid somewhere near my door in the morning. I was terrified. Soon after things started disappearing from my cottage. I ended up leaving pretty quickly. I never felt a sense of ease in those woods. They scared me my whole life and I don't know why. One last creepy Bonnie Dune story. I was driving down to town a good 20 plus minute drive around 4 in the morning and out of nowhere a mountain lion that was bigger than a grown man leapt out from the mountain onto the road as I was driving and it was the biggest cat I've seen in all my life. And of course I hit it and it splayed out and my car at the time had some issues and was known for stalking out. There I am looking right at this pissed off or scared lion, unable to get my car to start back up in the pitch black on an empty mountain road in the middle of the woods. I had to call the authorities but somehow the mountain lion slinked off into the woods and my car decided to start. The sheer panic I felt was insane. When I was very little, like five or six, my dad used to take me on all sorts of adventures through nature, especially when we owned a little cottage up in the Scottish Highlands. Now, my dad is sort of a combo Irish bloke plus Yorkshire laddie type of fellow and very spry. Despite his being about 55 at the time, and on this particular occasion had decided we were going to go hiking way up into the cliffs. I was quite happy with this development as it meant a piggyback ride for at least 90% of the difficult bits. This was a proper, proper trek. He wanted to get to one of the highest bluffs, so we could have an amazing 360-degree view of the gorgeous meadows and some sparkling sea. But after we reached the top plains, where it's all short, wind-whipped grass and you can see for miles, he suddenly turned very still and very quiet. When you're small, your parents are God, so seeing your dad look frightened is scarier than anything your own mind can come up with. So I was pulling on his arm and going, what? What? My mum is epileptic and I saw her fits when I was a kid so I thought it was happening to him too. Or something similar and I wouldn't know what to do because we're up on this huge cliff and no one is around. 
when just as fast as he started it, he snapped out of it. Fireman lifted me right up and just started striding away without a word. Over his shoulder, I could see a big, pale yellow object stuck into the ground like an obelisk. I know now that it was a refrigerator. When I was older and I asked my dad about it, he stiffened up and told me that when he was a boy in the 50s, he and his little friends had found an old-style fridge in the woods, and being little boys, they opened it. Well, of course, they had found a body another child, who by whichever means had found themselves in the fridge and unable to get out. My dad has never mentioned a gender which leads me to believe he either witnessed a very decomposed or skeletonized individual, but I can't ask him. Remember that episode of The Simpsons where they unlock Homer's PTSD, and it turns out he found a dead body when he was a teenager. My dad grew increasingly uncomfortable the first time we saw that episode and had excused himself to the kitchen before the ending. My dad has seen some gnarly shit, but for whatever reason he will not discuss anything further about this dead child in the fridge, only that it happened. So when he explained, I assumed it was the trauma and I said something like, Oh dad, that's awful so when you saw the fridge up there, it brang up the old memories. And he honestly looked at me with his big blue eyes like I was an idiot. I'll never forget it. No, Amy, he said in a very low tone. It was because it was the same fridge. Years ago, before we got married, my wife and I went to a local state park with a picnic and a hammock. We set the hammock up in the woods, enjoyed our picnic, then feel asleep together in the hammock. I was abruptly awakened by my wife. She motioned for me to be quiet. The sun had set. There was still a hint of light in the sky, but we couldn't see anything meaningful in the woods. My wife beckoned me to listen. Complete silence. Then the snap of a branch in the distance. More silence. We were both suddenly very on edge. We whispered to one another, trying to figure out if someone was sneaking up on us. The silence was broken again. Another branch, same direction but closer. Then from another direction a momentary crunch of leaves. Now we were terrified. We both had pocket knives on us, small but better than nothing. We also had a flashlight. We drew our knives and deliberated whether whatever was out there knew our location. We decided to keep the light off, lest we give away our exact location. Maybe we could run for the car. More steps in rapid succession, coming directly toward us, then silence again. My wife had enough. We know UFS are out there, she yelled. Silence for an eternity, and then another crunch of leaves. We had enough. We prepared ourselves as best we could for a fight, then shined the flashlight into the darkness, toward the last noise we had heard. Three deer scampered away into the darkness. We sheepishly gathered our things and left without incident. My family goes on trips to Telluride, Colorado once in a while up in the San Juan Mountains in the Rockies. On one trip a year or two ago, I decided to take the gondola to the top of Mount Sophia and walk along some of the trails to get a good look at the stars at around 10 p.m. at night by myself. I walk for about 20 minutes and 200-300 feet in altitude. It's very steep along the trails on top of the mountain. Away from the gondola station so there wouldn't be any light. The trail I was on ascends from about 10,000 feet to about 13,000 feet at its peak along the spine of the mountains surrounding Telluride. Every 100-200 feet you go up there is a semi-flat clearing fringed by the sheer drop-off on either side of the mountain spine. I was standing in the second clearing up from the gondola station. It was very quiet, very dark, and there wasn't even the slightest breeze. So quiet in fact that all I could hear was my own breathing. Since I was so high in altitude, it wasn't completely unexpected for there to be no animal noises since most animals don't live that high. But the lack of any sensory input at all besides the sound of my own breath really started to freak me out. I was up on the mountain for about a half hour when weird shit started to happen. The first thing that happened was an incredibly low, but loud humming sound that emanated from the east side of the mountain. I would estimate that the noise was coming from about 100 feet below the clearing where I was sitting. 
I thought at first it may be a mountain lion or some other type of animal, but the noise was consistent and lasted for about five minutes in total. After the noise cut off, I was understandably freaked out and got up to start heading back to the gondola station to go back to my hotel. As I started walking, though, there was suddenly a loud slapping sound coming from the west side of the mountain. The slapping sound sounded like someone taking a long stick and slamming it against a tree trunk as hard as they could in very fast succession. After that, I started to run down the mountain, which was dangerous considering how steep it was, but I was understandably noping the F out of there as fast as I could. The final thing that happened while I was still near the clearing was the humming sound again but this time it was pulsating almost in sync with the sound of the knocking wood. By the time I reached the first clearing before the one I was on, about 100 feet below where I first heard the noises, it became deathly silent again, followed by a huge gust of wind that shook all the trees violently, then followed by complete and utter silence. I reached the gondola station and got a scolding from the attendant for going out in the dark by myself, but I was so scared I just silently got in a gondola car and didn't respond to his comments. The whole trip down I kept my eyes shut and my fingers in my ears so I wouldn't see or hear any more creepy things. I'm sure there are plenty of explanations both natural and human for what I experienced, but being that isolated at that late at night that high up in the mountains is certainly an experience I do not want to repeat. I will say this, if it was local kids or something trying to scare me, they sure committed to a mostly unfruitful and dangerous effort. Not a lot of people, if any, went up on the trail where I was that late at night, and the places the sounds were emanating from were on very steep inclines, so steep that one slip would have you tumbling down the whole mountain. So I'm fairly convinced it wasn't locals pranking me. This happened to me a few years ago. I used to go to school at the University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm a runner and the campus is in a beautiful redwood forest, so I would run on the trails. One day I left a little later than usual on a run through one of the more isolated trails. Here's where it gets weird. I was about 15 minutes running deep into the woods and still hadn't seen anyone else around. Suddenly up ahead, I saw what appeared to be a homeless man in ragged clothing walking on the trail. Now he was walking further into the woods, and this path went very, very far and the sun was setting. Aka, this man was spending the night in the woods. I wanted to reach my usual running checkpoint before turning back, so I decided to keep my distance and run by. As soon as I passed the man, he called out to me. What came first, light or sound? In my head, I was like, WTF, this guy is nuts. But I decided to humor him and yelled out light without looking back. He said, well, I think it's sound, but who knows, and started mumbling to himself. I continued on. I reached my goal and started to head back. It was really dark now, and I was feeling sketched out that I had to pass this guy again to get back. He seemed pretty crazy and potentially dangerous, but I didn't have a choice. I got past the point where I first passed him, but he was nowhere to be seen. There weren't any other branches of the trail, and if he had headed back, I would have seen him by then. He must have gone off the trail. Suddenly a girl from up on a hill screamed for me to stop. I stopped and looked up on the hill, but it was too dark to see anything. I was freaked out. I called out to ask if she was all right and eventually saw her climbing down. The hill was really steep, so she put in a lot of effort to get up there and away from whatever was after her. She said that she was on a run when a scary homeless guy started harassing her, and he chased her up the hill. But she didn't know where he went. She was going to spend the night there until I came along because she was too scared to go back down. At this point, we both wanted to get the hell out of there. Who knew if this creepy man was like lurking around watching us from the dark? So we ran back together and made it to the road. She thanked me and we parted ways. Never ran back on that trail again. Santa Cruz can be a pretty weird place. I've heard legends of students flunking out of school there and then just living in the forest. Maybe this guy was a student from years past. It was bow season in the coast range of Oregon. 
My dad decided that he wanted to take my mom bow hunting and out for a cool experience in the woods. It was evening, and he decided to park his car up on a landing and watch the sunset and stars with my mom. They were asleep in the back of the wagon and were woke suddenly by a guy screaming and revving his old K5, while his bright lights were directed at my dad's car. The guy was screaming at my old man to, Get the F out here, you picked the wrong road to be on. I'm going to blow your F head off. My dad whispered to my mom to stay covered up and not to make any noise or movements. My old man had been in special forces and had also been an MP. He didn't however have anything except his bow. The stranger wasn't having any of it. I told you to get the F out here and I mean it. Now? My dad yelled out the window. All right man, I'm getting out. He slowly got out of the car while keeping the car between them. My mom said she could hear the guy work the bolt on his rifle and just knew my dad was dead. I don't know exactly what was said, but my mom said she heard my dad start talking to the guy, calm as could be. She said she heard the guy and said he sounded like he was drunk or on drugs. Eventually my dad was able to talk the guy down and he eventually left. After they watched the guy drive up to the next landing and sit there, my dad got in his car and told my mom to just stay put in the back and on the blanket while he drove out of there. My mom said that as soon as they took off they saw the guy start speeding their way. It turned into a car chase on a logging road with a long track to get back to the main road. She said it took forever for my dad to lose him but eventually they did. Said she has never been more scared of anything in her life. I don't know if anyone believes in Bigfoot, and I'm not sure if I do, but I wanted to tell this story. I never tell people because I know they won't believe me, and I don't want to be labeled a liar, but here we go. So about five, maybe six years ago, me and my friend snuck out of my house late one night, and my house had a river behind it and a forest across the road in front. So we go out and walk around smoking a cigar I stole from my dad. We walked around for about an hour. By then it would have been around 3 a.m. As we got closer to my house walking along the forest line, I turned to my friend and looked past him into the forest. About 10 feet past the tree line I see a big human-shaped thing with no neck or a very muscular neck and big shoulders. It was looking out at us. I froze and said to my friend, do you see that he looks over and starts running as fast as he could and so did I. When we got back to my house, we called it an alien. Didn't know what else to call it. It didn't look human. Was until about three years later that I told my brother about it and my dad and I described it to them. It was big about eight feet tall, had a black body with a gold color head. So my brother looks up what I saw in Google and something called Old Yellow Top comes up described as a Bigfoot. With dark body and yellow head and what makes it even more crazy is the sighting are in Ontario, Canada. And I also live in Ontario, Canada. I think the first sighting is from early 19s and me and my friend both 20 years old now still to this day swear we saw something in the forest that night. All I know is I never felt that kind of fear before and I don't think I ever will again. When I was 10 or 11, I was sitting at the top of a berm alone overlooking a beautiful valley. I must have sat there for a few minutes in the tall grass, soaking it up. I panned my head to the left slowly and roughly 75 meters away. I could see the ears, eyes and snout of a dogman sitting in the grass, looking right back at me. I darted back to safety as fast as I could. But when I got there, I realized that the cougar didn't give chase. It must have just been soaking up the scenery as well. I was working in the Magneti Morelli facility in Pulaski, Tennessee late evening. The date was January 16, 2016. I walked to the restroom near my work area. Upon entering the employee entrance, make a left turn in the first hallway, go through the next set of double doors, and turn right until you see a heavy steel door. I walked to the restroom and no one was there. In preparation for going back to the floor, I was washing my hands. That's when I felt someone watching me. I turned to look at a shiny silver baseball cap that was flat on top. I thought it was a ghost trying to see me and jumping back quickly with the tip of the brim exposed. 
my eyes caught sight of a man wearing a silver suit jacket, trousers, gloves, and low-top converse-like shoes made of light gray silver shades. His eyes did not blink. He quickly turned his face in the corner of the bulkhead and was afraid, quivering as I looked at him four feet away. I said, I didn't mean to frighten you, but I'm about to leave and it's all right. I'm shy too. I'm about to be done so I can get out of your way. I walked back to wash my hands, so he peeked. I thought he must really be ridiculed and humiliated by some of the other employees, but why is he working here if so? I have never seen him on this shift and didn't hear the big heavy steel door open with the machine's noise. He was not there when I walked in. He was not a ghost and intelligently moved. He made scuff sounds with his clothing touching the wall and was a solid flesh being. Then I said, I'm leaving now so the restroom is all yours. At a distance of about 11 feet I walk toward the bulkhead to start my way out. Then another employee opens the heavy steel door and the human-like entity darts from behind the wall and slides for a split second. He looks at me up and down and at my face nervously, as if to say you are not supposed to see me. He had long pointed ears and a thin bony pushed up nose and no hair around the cap edges. There was no emblem on any clothing. He quickly swung his head around to see if the employee had seen him yet. I saw a portal opening as he took those few steps between the urinal and the first toilet wall. He ducks his head slightly and leaps in to disappear. There's no way I can take this truth and the unknown to my grave. On a trail in the Angeles National Forest with a friend, about a mile in we hadn't seen anyone else since we entered. While rounding what we thought would be a secluded corner, my friend pulled out a joint and went to light up. The noise of the lighter sparking caused something up the trail to turn around quickly. I couldn't tell what it was right away because the lighting was dappled from trees above, and it was colored the same as the trail and rock. I grabbed my friend's arm and quietly said, stop, stand up, don't turn around, walk backwards slowly. About 30 feet in front of us was a cougar. Easily bigger than any dog I've ever seen, save a Great Dane or Bernese, but the musculature on it was otherworldly compared to any dog. It wasn't crouched like it was going to come for us. It was turned halfway with its back arched, the way a house cat sizes up another house cat before they fight. We backed up staring at the thing for what felt like forever but was only probably three, four seconds before it realized we weren't coming towards it anymore and turned tail. It bounded up what I thought was a sheer 20-foot cliff with such ease. It made my mind truly spin at the power of nature and thankful I wasn't asked to test it. We speed walked back to the trailhead with our heads on such a swivel, they rightly should have popped off. I was in Fort Lewis, Washington during officer candidate school. After a long day of patrols in the pines, my platoon had set up a cigar-shaped outpost and hunkered down for the night. I had second watch with my buddy Brian from Texas. We had set up a defensive position about 10 meters of the tip of the outpost and set up our M60. Our position was hunkered on the edge of this timberline that overlooked a meadow that was about 1,000 m wide by 200 m or so deep. The meadow then was bordered by another thick line of timber. Now, I must preface. We were in training and going to perform a raid on a simulated enemy village the next day. Our weapons were loaded with blanks, and we all had blank firing adapters on the muzzles. How the training worked is there were volunteers from other local army units who would play OPFOR and react to your presence accordingly with simulated gunfights, ambushes, reactions to contact, indirect fire, etc. Brian and I were fully expecting to get attacked that night by the Opfer. This was a common tactic to hit when trainees were tired and visibility was poor. However, that night was a full moon and Brian and I had snuck ground coffee into our pockets for later consumption. Our meadow was lit up by the glow of the moon. We had perfect visibility of the entire field of fire. Our defensive position was seemingly impregnable. We had overwatch, we had cover and concealment, and most importantly, we were wide awake. We were ready for anything the OPFOR threw at us. At about one in the morning, a low fog rolled in blanketing the meadow. 
The crisp night air punctuated the clarity of the moonlight. Brian and I were watching the meadow when he tapped my shoulder. He whispered in my ear. Do you see that? He pointed his finger out to the opposing tree line, where we could see slight movement along the line. I squinted my eyes and could make out shadowy figures slowly advancing towards our position. Brian pushed the safety off the M60, and I hunkered down behind my rifle to get a better look. We counted five, no three. No, maybe just four figures seemingly gliding out of the timber and onto the meadow. They were hunched over and slowly creeping towards us. The shadows of the trees still obscured the details of the figures. We were sure the OPFOR were conducting a raid on us, and they wanted to maybe take it easy on us, but to cross an open field was ludicrous and poor form. It was just too easy. Didn't these soldiers know they were about to be illuminated perfectly by the light of the full moon, and then would be easy targets for two OCS candidates? We watched the figures get closer to the light. Only maybe 50 more meters till the shadows ended, and we would have positive target ID and would engage. Brian whispered over to me. Where are their weapons? Brian was right. They appeared to be unarmed. Well, wait. Were they? They've got something in their hands. Is that a stick? I hissed back. We waited to see what these OPFOR had. The OPFOR finally crossed the shadows and entered the lit up meadow, less than 100M from our position according to our sector sketch. The figures appeared in full visibility of us. My eyes grew big as I realized what I was seeing. The figures were dressed in dusky brown loose fitting outfits and had what appeared to be small spears and axes. What was most unnerving was their faces were painted bright red and white, which glowed almost fluorescently under the full moon. I sucked in air. Brian screamed, contact, and let loose with the pig. The machine gun fire ripped through the calm of the still night air. The muzzle flash blinding us both. I lined up my sights on my rifle and fired several shots in succession of the M60. After about 20 seconds or so, we quit firing and surveyed the area. The meadow was empty. The figures were gone. Nowhere to be seen. Brian and I were both shaking. We looked around. No enemy soldiers to be seen, and perhaps even more strange, none of our platoon or the cotter had woken from the cacophony of gunfire. Brian and I hunkered down closer and waited for the inevitable second wave. The fog rolled out. What was that? I hissed. I don't know, Brian said. We waited for them to come back. They never did. Our watch ended after another hour of being frozen to our guns, eyes peeled on the meadow. We tried to sleep unsuccessfully. The next morning we asked if anyone heard any gunfire or commotion the night before. No one heard a thing. Hello, my name is Arnold, and I was contacted by my doppelganger. I know it sounds crazy that I am still alive, but hear me out. Not even a month ago, I was very skeptical about all of this mythology and urban legend stuff. I never thought that a Wendigo would be real or Bigfoot, and certainly not doppelgangers. This all changed when the start of this month, I was out looking for a story to write about. I am a journalist for my local news branch, which I will keep anonymous. I was told by this elderly woman that she has been experiencing weird and supernatural stuff around her small ranch, which was about 10 minutes outside of the city. She said, I keep hearing voices and cries of my children outside begging to come in. My kids died years ago in a house fire. I know I'm not crazy. Can you investigate? You're my last hope because the police just think I'm old and senile. I wrote all of this down, including her address, I expressed concern, but at the time it was a feign. I didn't believe a lick of what she said since to me this stuff was all explained by science. But in case there were some pranksters or whatever, I decided to pack up some supplies I bought years ago. You see, when I was younger, my father and I used to go bow hunting in the woods behind his house. A year ago at night, I was spending the night there as we plan on tracking this giant buck that kept walking near the home. I remember the night he went missing since I had an emergency at work. He and I were sitting there drinking coffee and remembering the good old days of when I was a teen. 
how he and I used to hunt every weekend and how we always brought something back home to eat. I can see now the smell of dark roasted Folgers coffee on the pot with slightly stale Walmart donuts. I was flipping through a book that had that old book smell, you know. It was a great night. However, around midnight my boss and editor called me on an emergency. Turns out a kid went missing a year ago, and they just found her, and they had the first interview with her. It was going to be with me since I was the most experienced with trauma cases. I packed my stuff and hugged my dad. Where are you going, son? We got a big prize tomorrow morning, are you going to be back by then? He looked at me slightly worried, but I said, of course. We've been tracking it since mom died, I won't miss this for the world. Just my job called on a huge interview and they need me. He looked at me nodded and I walked out the door. I could have sworn I saw him cry a little, but that's hindsight looking back. After the interview, I went back home and set an alarm for 4am. This was so I can wake up in time to go to my dad's and start packing up. When I woke up it was noon and I was extremely late. I rushed to the cabin and saw a note my dad left on the door. I wish you were here. But honestly, I'm glad you didn't show up. I love you son and I'm going to get this son of a bitch. Stay here and wait I left coffee on warm for you. I smiled at the note I saw and how he still thinks of me as his little boy despite me being twice his size. Hours went past and it was getting dark out. I started to panic when I heard gunshots not far from home. I rushed out with my rifle and followed the noise. The thick bush made it harder and harder to see as the rich vegetation was swallowing the light. I finally got to where the sounds were and it stopped. Instead, I heard something cry out, help me, and it wasn't my dad's voice. I ran back to the cabin at full speed. At this point, the sky was pitch black with a little moonlight shining through the trees. I can hear a large creature chasing me, but I never looked back. As I got to the cabin I heard another gunshot and my dad yelling one final time. Run boy, get the F out of here, hey you big dumb animal come here. That was the last thing I heard my father say. I heard screams in the distance as I kept running, and in the morning the police showed up and found my father's clothes and his severed arm. They said it was a bear attack which I was so blinded by grief. I kept believing until recently. When I arrived at the old woman's home, she greeted me with coffee or tea. I took coffee. I could recognize the smell from anywhere. Folger's dark roast, I said after taking a deep whiff. Well, how did you know? She asked with a warm smile. Well, my father used to make us coffee every day after my mother passed away. It was a bonding thing, so this is a sweet delight. She asked. Oh, that's good. Do you and your dad spend time often? I looked down at the floor and sniffled a little because thinking of the night was something of a nightmare. And, no, he went missing a year ago and I haven't had coffee since. But it's a nice gesture and makes me a little happier. She covered her mouth and apologized, but I waved it off as it wasn't her fault since she didn't know. I got to know her name after sitting a while, Agatha Christie. She has been on the ranch ever since she was a girl, but it's more of a home than a farm nowadays. She said she has a ranch hand that comes out once a day to feed the animals and help her sell the ones ready. However, it's been almost a week and he hasn't come to work. She's afraid the creatures outside that have been attacking her livestock scared him away. She looked at me and asked if I brought cameras and other things to help find what is causing her all this pain. These things call out to her at night, and she has a few recordings. Nothing on camera, just a voice from a tape recorder. She played the most recent tape. For about a minute, it was something calling out, Mom, I am cold, let me in. At first, it sounded like a child. Agatha was in tears as she was playing this back. That's my boy. That's his voice, she said, covering her mouth. I grabbed a handkerchief and gave it to her for her eyes. Now we know something is out there messing with you, I will set up a few cameras to see what is going on. She hugged me and thanked me. I just want all of this to go away. She said silently. I stood up after a few more minutes of getting details about the property. 
On the south side of the barn was a fence line that stretched for about 100 yards. I placed one camera every 25 yards and on every corner. These cameras were top-of-the-line motion sensing and night vision cameras, with full 4K capability and nay bulletproof glass. Then I set one up on each facing an entrance to the home. After about an hour of setting it up, we were all set since they were all synced and ready to go. Agatha looked a lot happier than someone is here with her. She locked all the doors and windows and let me stay the night so I can monitor the cameras. In the middle of nowhere, she didn't have internet, but I brought a portable Wi-Fi box to do some research and keep up with my friends who wanted to play some MTGEDH tonight. After my first game playing my mono green Eldrazi deck Don't Hate Me, I got a notification on the cameras. One was going crazy saying something is moving. I pulled the camera up and watched the feed. It was a deer. Thank God just a dumb deer haha. -ha. I laughed it off, but then something strange started to happen. It stared right into the camera and slowly walked toward it. This was odd but deer sometimes sniff and check out random shit, so I assumed that's what it was doing. As it got closer I started to notice something was off. It looked like a deer but had human eyes and blinked irregularly. Every step that it took was wobbly and its legs were backward. Now I know some diseases infect deer to make them look emaciated and do weird shit like run in circles. But this deer just looked in the camera lens as if it were looking at me. It stared at the camera and when I saw its full face it had razor sharp teeth. What the F is that? I said quietly. It somehow heard me and snapped its head to the house I was in, and smiled, showing rows of sharp teeth some were gnarled and twisted. What the F is that? I said in a hushed tone. It then lowered itself and twisted its neck toward the camera to show some psychotic smile as it crouched into a stance that was spider-like and began darting toward the home. I quickly got up and grabbed the pistol that I brought in case Agatha wasn't lying. Speaking of which, she rushed into my room crying that, It's going to eat me. Please stop it. I hit her behind me and closed the door, slowly walking to the front door where this thing was pounding its head into it. Each hit got harder and harder, louder and louder. The thumping left a thick paste on the windows that was black and smelled of rot. The sickening smell and the sound of squelching meat slapping on the door were making my stomach churn. Before I got to the end of the steps, I heard a voice. It sounded like mine saying, I'm here to help, please don't fire. You will only attract it more. I looked toward the kitchen where the sound was coming from. Before I was, me, but nude and without any discernible male features. It stood there. A doppelganger? My instincts were flaring up with every ounce of me telling me to run or drop a whole magazine into its chest. Don't fire, trust me. I don't want you or Agatha to be hurt. Your father sent me over a year ago to protect you from this, not dear. This thing killed your father and mother and now is gunning for you. I was so confused at the time, but also scared shitless. What the F did you say? My father died last. Before I can finish it cut me off. He did die last year and before he did I fought the not dear off. This thing attacked your father, not me, and not a bear. Our doppelgangers don't look like the ones we're trying to kill or replace, but the ones we are trying to protect. I felt unease not from the copycat, but from the not deer calling my name as if it was my father. Let me in, son, I miss you. It said in my father's tone and affection, but a little off, and it was noticeable enough. Okay, okay, I won't shoot, but how the F do we kill that? Thing. I pointed the gun at the door that was slowly losing its stability. I will handle it. Go upstairs and don't come back down until sunrise. Once it's quiet and the sun is out, go to the edge of the property by the forest. I will speak there. I trusted it. It was life or death, and this was the best thing I can do. I ran upstairs and locked the door, Agatha, and I was in. We heard the door burst down and heard the two things fighting downstairs. Yelling and growling were being drowned out by the sound of bones crunching and flesh being ripped and muscle being snapped like rubber bands. It was 8 a.m. when the sound stopped and I heard the door close. 
After about 30 minutes, Agatha fell asleep, and I gathered the courage to open the door and walk downstairs. The walls and floor were covered in blackish-green blood and viscera. The smell made me vomit, but the head of the not-deer lay on the floor rotting away at an alarming pace. I kept my word and walked to the edge of the forest. There I saw my doppelganger slowly appear out of the forest and prop itself against a log. It had a few bruises and cuts, but was mostly fine. I told you he'll protect you. I promised your dad. I didn't know what to say other than I. What are you? Why do people say you kill the people you look like? It looked at me and laughed a little before Audible readjusting its arm back into its socket. There's a lot you don't know. Your dad was a killer of cryptids and I was his guardian before he died. We protect, but when the person dies we move on to the next of kin. Doppelgangers serve as a distraction to the potential dangers of the world. And you are from a long line of cryptid killers. I took a step back as my memory started to flood me. I repressed so much, but I remember the things my dad and I hunted were all cryptids. Wendigos, not deer, werewolf, skunk ape, and even lesser known ones like the Grafton monster. I was so in shock my ears started to ring and the doppelganger rushed by me to keep me from falling. I shook out of it and it looked at me with black eyes. Are you okay? It asked with a worried expression. I, uh, yeah, I am okay. I pinched the space between my eyebrows as a headache was climbing. After a short talk, I was convinced it was going to keep me and Agatha safe. However, this ranch has a darker secret, and it wants to see why so many cryptids are attached and attracted to it. That's where I am at now. Researching this little home ranch. I will find something. I must find something. Until I do stay tuned and good luck out there. Oh, and if you see a doppelganger, do not be afraid as it could save your life. I recently had my very first sighting of a cryptid. I was working at a national forest as a park ranger and got the job temporarily full-time. I was to replace a maintenance worker for a couple of weeks while he went away on vacation. In the meantime, I got up bright and early to go out on a run, come back to the cabin I currently live in at the campground, and got dressed for work. A couple of days before the incident at hand, I ran into a young woman as she was leaving her campsite. She said that she had just arrived and woke up to a strange noise in the middle of the night. I find myself driving down a lower road used for maintenance workers, and I approached a clearing with a dirt berm on one side. It is there that I hit something with my truck, and it nearly threw me out of my seat. Once I regained composure, both mentally and physically, I hopped out of the truck to see what it was. What appeared before me was not man-made, at least not by human hands. Jumping back into my truck, I did a quick three-point turn and went back to camp. It was there that I grabbed my rifle from the cabin door, strapped it into the gun rack in the truck, and drove onto the dirt berm. As I got out of the truck, at about 100 yards from where I hit it, whatever it was was now standing up on two legs with its arms held straight up in the air like it was reaching. My first thought was that this was a werewolf or some sort of Bigfoot. I did what anybody would do in this situation. I raised my rifle and fired one round directly at the thing's head. The bullet hit true, right between the thing's eyes, killing it instantly. Standing there for a few seconds, looking around, thinking just how lucky I was that nobody else had come across this thing, only to get back in my truck and go about my day. That night after work when I got back to camp, I took a shower before dinner. The next day when I got to work, my co-worker came to ask me if anybody else saw what I hit the other day. Of course, I asked why he wanted to know. He told me an officer from the sheriff's department stopped by and was asking if anybody had gone to that clearing and hit anything with their vehicle. When I told him about my incident, he told me he would talk to the officer for me. I have a bad feeling about this. Telling my story has gotten easier to think about over the years, but the end of this incident was the hardest thing for me to accept as fact. I've told one person for 13 and a half years. I'm anxious already, but here it is. 
I'm doing this now mostly to get it out of my head and off my chest. Thinking about it sometimes gives me anxiety. I don't know how people talk about these experiences. It was so unexpected. I have been hunting black-tailed deer in Washington State for more than 30 years. This was a great day for hunting with hard rain and gusty winds. I was boat hunting and heading to my area. It's just over six miles away. I made it to my tree, took up my pack, and started to prepare my tree. I was ready to toss the rope over a branch when I heard a deep-voiced child crying out. It sounds completely nuts, but it's 100% true, and it's the only way I can explain it. It sounded like a deep-voiced child, no words, just moans and crying. As soon as I heard someone needed help, I grabbed my pack and bow and headed in that direction with urgency. It is much farther than I originally estimated. There was an old overgrown logging road with some trees broken and bent down on the side. I guess the hole was naturally created on this road. The heavy rain pooled up in an area and sunk in around seven feet deep. It was such an abrupt fall I worried about sliding in. As soon as I arrived I announced, I'm here, it's gonna be okay. I tied the rope to a tree. It stopped making childlike cries. All I heard was an off and on slight moan, like an odd hum. I continued to believe it was just a first season young hunter that was extremely scared, maybe injured. It's okay kiddo. My name is Tony, what's yours? I tied off my tree hoist and tossed it. Then as soon as I released the rope into the hole, all hell broke loose. I'm getting goosebumps right now. It was crazy. The trees less than 10 yards away swayed and some snapped off. Then a horrifying growl started. With a deeper growl, it was exactly like an angry bear. I pulled up my 10 millimeter from its holster and slid on my butt in reverse. I just knew that a large black bear would sprint out of the trees any second. I had a flashlight in my pocket. I pulled it up and held it down into the hole while pointing my 10 mil at the trees. I was so confused when I saw it. I began to feel like this couldn't happen. I started to think I was losing it, then I got my first look at what I thought was a child. It was a child, but not a human. I panicked, fell backwards, dropping everything including my 10 mil. I quickly crawled forward scratching the earth for my pistol. My heart was beating so hard that I thought a heart attack was coming. I could hear my heart beat. I estimated it was just over five feet tall with hair all over it. There was mud and debris knotted to its hair. It was clearly scared and was slightly limping on its right side after it exited the hole. The adult in the trees was very tall with more hair and wider shoulders. They walked away. I sat in the same spot three feet from the sinkhole with mud all over me and my pistol sitting on my lap. I just had to catch my breath. I couldn't understand that these animals were real. Later, I returned home and knew if I didn't come back I would never hunt again. I went back the next day. I just stayed on the road the whole time. My hand shake a little. I didn't hunt, I just looked around. Then I relaxed a bit. I came around the corner on the logging road and right in the middle was my tree seat and two other things I dropped on my way out. Then I noticed they left pine cones for me. Grass and branches were also stacked. I think they wanted me to have it. I honestly don't know for sure, but it was directly on top of my stuff and assembled deliberately. Thanks for letting me get this off my chest. I've been afraid to speak of this all these years, though my wife knows about it. Thanks for listening, Horror Cowboys. See you tomorrow at the same time.